Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Character's Journey Podcast. Hi. Starring Sav and Joe. Oh, man. Oh, you switched it up. You caught me off guard. We're switching it up. <laughs> that caught me off guard. I'm a creature of habit. And I'm Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair enough. How are you feeling? We just uh, we just recorded a surprisingly emotional episode. Yeah, you're the last episode on on coup from from uh, Sav's D and D character creations. I feel pretty okay. That's good. Like it's it's one of those things. Um, like you said in the podcast, these characters become really real too. They do, and you don't realize it until you start talking about them Mm -hmm. and you really observe them which funnily enough ties really well into what we're talking about today which we're going to be talking about truman burbank from the truman show wow which is an excellent movie if you haven't seen it um if you haven't seen it please go watch it it is uh free right now on paramount plus um and if it's not on paramount plus by the time you listen to this, or if you don't have Paramount Plus, please just buy it <laughs> or rent it. Mm-hmm. It's worth yeah. every penny. It's so, so good. It's a perfect example of a character in a world that you you know it's a real person, but you're separating that to satisfy your voyeuristic tendencies. It's the best way I know how to put it. But yeah, yeah. So I love the. We're film. starting heavy. It's so bad, dude. I mean, it's not bad. It's like phenomenal, but it's so heavy. You're right. Um. So the movie begins with um. A deposition from the creator of the Truman Show, and his name is Kristoff, and uh, it it also begins with interviews from some of the actors that are real people that are playing characters in Truman's life. Uh, So like one of them is his wife, Meryl, and his best friend, Marlon. Um, And something that Meryl says really stuck with me when I heard it. Um, She says, there's no difference between a public life and a private life. Hmm. She said, my life is my life. When when people have asked her, because she's playing a, a part in the Truman Show, she's acting as Truman's wife. So people ask her like, well, what is it, you know, what, what's your public life and private life like? And she's like, well, my life is my life, Mm -hmm. which is insane to think about because all of this is real to Truman. This is his life. He doesn't know he's being filmed. And so this marriage is, it's not real. Yeah. It's not real. Oh yeah. Um, and something else that is said is nothing you see is fake. It's merely controlled, which also kind of hit me like a brick. Yeah. (laughs) So the whole thing with the Truman Show is it's a real human being that was born on television. And you you learn this throughout the film is um, it was a decision between him and five other unwanted pregnancies. Yeah. And so Truman just happened to be the one born on production time. Like he was the one who fit the schedule. So he was the lucky winner of having his entire life exploited to the world. It's a global show. Um, And he doesn't know. Everything is hidden. All of the cameras are hidden. Um, Obviously, like, nobody tells him anything. Like, all of these actors in his life are playing roles. (laughs) It's really disturbing on the surface, but it's even worse when you think about it for more than, like, a second. I feel like this is going to be an episode where I don't talk a lot. (laughs) Because my brain is just going to it's horrifying. Go haywire. It's a horrifying thought. So the movie starts on day ten thousand nine hundred and nine of Truman's life. So he's thirty years old, and there's this really iconic line that comes into play later that uh, was coined by Truman, and it's kind of his catchphrase. And he says, "In case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night." And um, Excellent, you know, super cool, happy, feel good, whatever. And you're watching him go about his day. He is um, an insurance agent and he 
you know, goes through town. He has his morning routine um, where he does something silly in the in the bathroom mirror and then he goes outside and goes through town and everybody in town knows him. Like this is like a very small town feel. Everybody's like, hi, Truman. Hey, Truman, how are you? How's the wife, you know? And he starts his day by like buying um, a newspaper and a magazine from this magazine stand. And the guy at the counter like jokes because it's a woman's fashion magazine. He's like, oh, is this for the wife? And Truman's like, oh, you know it. She can't get enough of them, you know. Come to find out, he goes into his office and he's looking through the magazine and he's analyzing certain facial features of the women. And we don't know why yet. But he also gets on the phone and he is trying to book a vacation to Fiji. So he's whispering about it, though, which is a little odd because you would think like, oh, like, why are you hiding the fact that you want to go on a vacation. Like, that's very cool. Um, and he's looking for a specific name. Um, he's looking for a Sylvia in Fiji. So he, he's trying to get to Fiji, and he's looking for somebody named Sylvia. So the film goes on. There are moments where Truman um, is, like, becoming really aware, and he's like, I need to get out of this town, which is a sea haven. It's the town of Sea Haven. So he, he's talking to his best friend Marlon, and he goes, he goes, don't you ever get antsy, itchy feet. And um, Marlon's like, no, like, what are you even talking about? And, you know, Truman's like, he's like, don't you just want to go? Like, don't you want to see the world? Don't you want to be out, out of here? Like, have you ever left Sea Haven? And, and Marlon's like, yeah, I have, but I've never found a place like this. Like, really trying to keep Truman grounded because Truman can't leave, unbeknownst to him. Yeah. He's on a set. He's on a built set. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Marlon... What sort of dystopian mind created this? It's insane. Like, it, it'll, it'll blow your mind. It'll change your entire perspective, right? So uh, Marlon says something like, well, where's there to go? And Truman's like, Fiji. And Marlon's like, what you, why, why Fiji? And Truman says, it's the farthest away I can get from here without circling back around the globe. He's like, this is the farthest I can get before you start to circle back. So he's just like really trying to leave. He's telling his wife, Meryl, like, I really want to leave. And she's like, oh, honey, like, how are we going to pay the bills? You know, like everything that they do is to try to keep Truman grounded in Sea Haven so that he doesn't leave because he can't. Right. Because Sea Haven doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So a lot of other things happen. Um, Truman has a crippling fear of water. Because when he was eight years old, his dad died in a boating accident. Oh. Oh. Yeah. His dad died in a boating accident. So his parents are also in on this? They're not real. He was an unwanted pregnancy. Who's his parents? They're actors. Oh. Uh, yeah, they're actors. He was put up for adoption. Yeah. So he was adopted by a corporation. Um, that is something that is said is like he's the first baby to be adopted what? by a corporation. Yeah, it's it's heavy. So Truman, since he was... My heart's already breaking. Oh, it gets better. Truman wanted to be an adventurer. He wanted to explore and go travel and do all of these great and big things. And so to keep him in Sea Haven and to prevent that desire, they killed his dad. What the f***? <laughs> they didn't actually kill him, feel, but they made Truman think I he feel died. Bad. I feel bad for the actor who's playing his dad. Like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta leave. <laughs> oh, so the actor who plays his dad, this is the next part of the story, sneaks back onto set and makes contact with Truman, which then freaks Truman out because he's like, I saw you die. Oh my gosh. And he says like, dad, and then a bunch of actors come in and swoop and take the guy away. And then everything goes back to normal. And Truman is like, what just happened? And he goes to his mom's house and is like, I swear to you, I saw dad. I swear, I swear to you, it was him. Like, did he have a brother? They never found the body. Like, I think this is my, I think this is dad. But really, it was an actor who was mad that he got written off the show. So he snuck back onto set to get his part back. <laughs> 20 something years later. <laughs> he holds a grudge, man. <laughs> So they, Unions. so they wrote him back into the show um, as a like, oh, look, it was a miracle. He was found. Yay. Because you can't really explain that away. And they're trying to keep this as real as possible for Truman. Because the, the whole facade is we are giving Truman a normal life. We're just televising it. Right. 
Right, right. Now, I know. I know. So remember I mentioned Sylvia. Right. Sylvia, and, and you hear some backstory through like viewers of The Truman Show. So you are simultaneously a viewer of The Truman Show, but you also see other people's outside perspective watching the show. And okay. they mention uh, Truman is like down in the basement. He's like fondling a sweater that he kept all these years. And there's a button on the sweater that says, how is it going to end? And, and so he's kept this sweater and he's like messing with it. And it cuts away to two girls, the two waitresses in a diner who were like, yeah, they couldn't erase her mem- like the memory of her from him, but they got rid of her, but they, they just couldn't make him forget. Truman noticed a girl in college and he was smitten with her immediately. He was like, oh my gosh, like you're, wow, like, like love at first sight. And that wasn't part of the producer's plans. <laughs> so, so they removed her from the situation and forced Meryl into his lap, pretty much. And that's how he met his wife. He met her in college. But he never forgot Sylvia and he would see Sylvia around. And there was one time where she was in the library and he was studying and he saw her and he says, hey, like, can I take you like to dinner? And she's like, I'm not supposed to talk to you. And he's like, well, why? He's like, do you have a, do you have a boyfriend or something? And, and she's like, no, like, they really don't want me talking to you. Like, I can't, I can't talk to you. And he's, like, going through, <laughs> like, Jim Carrey just, <laughs> the way he plays this part is so endearing and sweet. He's like, oh, is it, am I just not your type? Or, like, like he's, like, really playing it up, like, being really cute and really sweet about it. And um, he, he recognizes her name as uh, Lauren, Lauren Garland, because that's, like, her cast member name. So yeah. he knows her as Lauren. So he's like, hey, like, like, let's go eat, you know, like, let, let's just go somewhere. Like, I'm not actually dating Meryl. Um, we're just friends. Um, <laughs> and they are. They're just friends. And he really likes Lauren. So she's like, we need to go now or it won't happen. And he's like, OK, cool. So they run and go and have a very cute moment on the beach. And she's like, they're going to find me. And he's like, oh, well, you know, like, it's, you know, it's OK. And, you know, whatever. And this car pulls up and she starts like just spilling what this is. She's like, this isn't real. None of this is real. My name is Sylvia. You need to get out and not listen to anybody. And so Truman is like, what are you talking about? And an actor who's playing her father takes her away, says, oh, she does this all the time. She did this with the last boy. Like she always has these episodes and explains it away as schizophrenia. Isn't that great? Oh, <laughs> So she is like fighting against her father and uh, the dad like throws out, we're moving to Fiji. So Truman never forgot that. And he's been looking for Lauren ever since and trying to get to her. So he is living through his life and he just starts to, to notice things, right? And so with the how does it end button, he also told Lauren, uh, Sylvia, I've been wondering that myself. Because the button was merch for the Truman Show. Yeah. How's it going to end? And he took it like philosophically, like, yeah, I've been, I've been wondering that too. Like, how's it going to end? It's insane, the dichotomy of it, you know? Because it's like, holy crap. Did, based on your perspective, something like that means something entirely different so things start happening Truman accidentally tunes his radio to tune in with the production headsets so he hears cues being called and like okay he's turning on to Pleasant Street like ready the you know whatever and he's like what is going on you know and he goes um like right after that he goes into a building he doesn't usually go into and people are trying to get him out. Like, oh, sir, like, what are you doing? You're trespassing, you know, whatever. He tries to get onto an elevator and the elevator goes, the door's shut, the elevator comes back, but it's backstage, like production backstage. And he sees this. He sees like people sitting down next to food and he sees like them just get up and not say anything and leave. And he's like, what is going on? <laughs> like, like his whole world is getting shattered. And so he goes to see his best friend and he's like, I need to talk to you like right now. So they go, they leave and they have like a whole heart to heart moment where 
his friend basically gaslights him and says, no one is in on anything. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I would never lie to you. And he says to him, like, if everybody's in on it, I would also have to be in on it. So Truman naturally believes his best friend thinks he's crazy <laughs> and, and can't shake this because he knows what he saw, right? So his wife is leaving to go to the hospital. She's a nurse and she's leaving to go to the hospital for her shift. And, uh, her, you know, Truman is like, where are you going in such a hurry? And um, she explains away the elevator situation. Like, oh, this elevator snapped in that building. Like, so many people got hurt. Like, I have to do an amputation. Um, and she says to him, like, it's not even worth thinking about. So again, that constant deflection of like Truman, like your reality yeah. is is here. Like, it's not there. You didn't see that. Don't worry. Um, so of course, he follows her and tries to catch everybody in a lie. And he he unfortunately cannot this time. But he is so convinced. He's like, no, there's something wrong. So, so the thing that kind of set him off with that is he noticed in his wedding photo that his wife's fingers were crossed while she kissed him. And he was <laughs> like... That's weird. So like she's she's leaving, you know, for her job. And before he leaves after her, he says, uh, I'll cross my fingers for you. And she gives him a look like, OK, and and leaves. And so then he yeah, he chases after her and whatever. So when she comes home, he is sitting in his car and he's watching the street and he's like, I have noticed a pattern. He's like, I will predict to you right now that a woman on a red bike will come a man with flowers, and then a beetle with a dented fender. And they sit there and wait. And, uh, and his wife is like, that's ridiculous. Like, let's go inside. You know, like just trying to get him away from the situation. And um, sure enough, woman on a red bike, man with flowers, beetle with a dented fender. He's like, they're on a loop. They have been going by constantly. I have, they're, they're, it's a pattern. They go around the block and they come right back. And of course, Meryl is like, oh no, like that's not, don't, like what are you talking about? You're so crazy. And She's like, this is about you wanting to go to Fiji. Like, fine, just save up for a couple months and go. And he's like, well, how about we just go now? And just like pulls out of the driveway and starts like driving, tries to catch things off guard, um, but is somehow met with a jam at every turn. And he points that out. He's like, isn't that so weird that this was an empty street and now there's <laughs> so much traffic? And, uh, you know, he eventually delineates away from that. He gets through, but they set up a forest fire, which he gets through. And then they set up a nuclear plant leak. Like they are trying <laughs> to keep him. Yeah. And so he gets to the nuclear plant. He's like, okay, I'm being crazy. And he, he tells the nuclear plant guy, like, thank you. You know, thank you, sir. And the nuclear plant guy slips and says, you're welcome, Truman. And Truman has never met this guy in his life. So he is like, there's no way. He starts like trying to get out, but he's detained, you know, whatever. <sighs> Come back home. Meryl starts gaslighting him and is like, you're not well. You need help. You're scaring me. He snaps because she's pointing like a, a potato peeler Jeez. at him. Like, you're scaring me. It was like a three in one. And he yeah. goes, what are you going to do? Like slice me, dice me or peel me. And he grabs it from her and like puts her in like a, a hold. And he's, he's not like trying to threaten her, I don't think, but he like has it. And she yells up to the ceiling, do something. And so Truman is like, who are you talking to? And she's like, I didn't say anything. He's like, I, you yelled, do something. And she's like, no, I didn't. And so they send in Marlon to do damage control and she collapses in Marlon's arms and is like, oh, thank God. Like, how can they keep expecting me to work in these conditions? It's unprofessional, like wailing, like freaking out. <sighs> and then that is where, you know, like Marlon was like, look, like there's nothing going on. So I, I sorry, I misspoke earlier with him. I, I misquoted the, the scene, but Truman says like, it feels like the whole world revolves around me somehow. And he's like, well, that's a lot of world for one man. Um, you know, just the constant deflection, constant, constant, constant deflection. Yeah. So that was it. That was the, uh, so I apologize for earlier, but he says, if everyone is in on it, I'd be in on it too. So he's like trying to comfort him. And then we get a break from Truman and we see some of the behind the scenes with the staff. So you get to see the, the real world, so to speak. And Kristoff uh, yeah. sits down 
and has an interview. Um, and he says a couple of things that were really compelling to me. He says, and this is a direct quote, we accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Hmm. And that freaked me out <laughs> because that was the whole thing about like, well, this isn't real for Truman. And he's like, yes, it is. We accept the reality that we're presented. This is real. Yeah. Um, he also says that he could leave at any time if he really wanted to, that there would be nothing they could do to stop him. Yeah. He is holding on to the fact because Sylvia calls in and lights him up and is like, you're a horrible person for doing this to him. And he's like, no, no. Aww. He's like, I have given him a chance at a normal life. And he talks about how like, he talks about it later with, anyway, we'll get there. So, so Kristoff has like a full on like God complex. He calls himself the creator. So, no, so not, quite literally, okay. yes, he has a God complex. He is the God complex. So the next day, he draws like a little space suit on himself. Like he does his silly little antics in the mirror. But he starts it by saying, hello, can you hear me? And so the producers are like, oh my gosh, can he like, is he talking to us? Like, can he see us? And they're going to call Kristoff. And then he starts with his antics. He ends his antics, though, I appreciate it. He went, that one's for free. And he left. He leaves the room. It's like, okay, so you, he knows, he suspects. He's starting to realize. He's suspecting something is just not quite right. Uh, so he's leaning into the game. Which is going to make them lose ratings. Oh. Oh, you wait. So he eventually is able to finagle his way out and get around the cameras. Yeah. So he, he pretends to go to sleep in his basement because uh, Meryl is leaving him. Uh, that was like a whole thing. A new love interest was introduced. And yeah, Meryl was written off because of his episode. So they're trying to make it as normal as possible, I guess. And here's a new love interest. And he's really like leaning into the game where he's, he's like fussing at somebody over the phone about insurance. And he looks at the love interest and sits back in his chair and is like, I guess what I'm saying is life is fragile. You're like really hamming it up for him because he knows he's about to get in out of there. Way, yeah. In a way that only Jim Carrey can. Oh my gosh. It's so magnifico. So he pretends to go to sleep in his basement. The producers aren't paying close enough attention and he's able to fool them into thinking that he's asleep. So he gets out of the house being unnoticed. So, of course, like, Kristoff comes in just to do check-ins, and they're like, where is he? Like, where is Truman? And they're like, oh, he's right there sleeping. They slowed down the footage and saw him crawl away. They saw his hand enter a frame. So they're like, <laughs> oh, th he's in the house somewhere. So they send Marlon in for a surprise party, and he starts looking for him. And the producer is like, and this is something that Kristoff did when Jim Carrey uh, performed a beautiful monologue about the world revolving around him earlier. The producer was feeding lines into Marlon's ear for Marlon to say to Truman. Hmm. Yeah. So he's doing the same thing here where, where Marlon is like, Oh, where are you Truman? LOL. And uh, Christoph's like, yeah, that's good. Like, keep it light, keep it fun. Um, and they can't find him, but they do find where he tunneled out of the house. Like he made a hole in the ceiling and got out through his mm -hmm. yard, completely undetected. So the whole town rallies to find him, right? Because this is an emergency now. Like, the star is missing. Yeah. And uh, Marlon is like, yo, like, we cannot find him. And so Kristoff is like, okay, make it daytime. But it's too early in the morning to do that. So he's just completely risking blowing everything up. Where is Truman, do you think? <laughs> Where do I think he yeah. is? I think he's right behind Kristoff. I think he's like right there in the room with him. Oh, that would have been cool. Kind of. But he, he's actually on a boat sailing away from Sea Haven with his oh. crippling fear of water. Good for him. Well, um, remember that whole thing of... Oh. Oh, yeah. So he... <laughs> oh. Oh, no. He is seen on the boat. He's so happy because he's like, I'm getting out. He takes out a picture that he has pasted together. And what he was doing with these women's magazines is he was finding attributes that looked just like Sylvia and recreated her face on a photo from all of these oh, different so 
it's very sad, but he like takes it out and looks at it and he puts it back in his pocket and he's like, okay, like we're going to go. Kristoff then orders a storm to be localized over the boat. <laughs> there, he is 100% weaponizing trauma to make him compliant and to keep him yeah. in Sea Haven, which is interesting because didn't he just say, if he really wanted to leave, he could. Yeah. Paul Giamatti is in this film as well. He plays one of the other producers. And he says to Kristoff, like, you're going to kill him. Like, we can't kill him in front of a live audience. And um, Kristoff says he was born in front of a live audience. So all humanity has, uh, has gone out the window. Oh, and I forgot to mention, this was so important. I'm so sorry. I got to go back. This is, my, this is my storytelling at its peak. <laughs> when they lost him, they cut transmission for the first time ever. Wow. Transmission was cut on day 10,913. So we started at 10,909 and transmission was cut at 10,913. So anyways, back to Truman. He's on a boat. He is so funny and brazen that he looks up at the sky and he says, if you're going to stop me, you're going to have to try and kill me. And he's like, is that all you got? You know, whatever. So Kristoff takes this as a challenge and uh, capsizes <laughs> the boat. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, Truman had tied himself to the boat. Oh, no. So when it seems like Truman maybe had drowned, Kristoff was like, OK, that's enough. Like, turn it off. Because the producer was like, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do that. And um, Kristoff just did it. He initiated it. They turned it off. He's okay. <laughs> he was okay. He came back up. He was coughing. You know, he was like, Ugh, you know, whatever. But he got his wits about him and he keeps sailing. And then the boat punctures the set. He runs into the sky. Goes right through. And he, there's this moment that I, it breaks me every time because he sees that and he, you can see the wash of dread fall on his face and he starts pounding against the wall he starts like throwing himself against the wall and like trying to break the wall and he just starts sobbing and um wow i mean if we can just pause to be enamored by jim carrey's performance um it's so emotionally taxing to watch it happen. It's, it's incredible. So he, he notices that he can walk along the perimeter of the water because it's, it's a set. So he's at the yeah. perimeter of the pool pretty much. And he sees a staircase that's built into the wall. So he starts climbing it. Um, it's really cinematic and beautiful. He starts climbing the stairway and he sees a door that says exit. And he opens the door and it's completely black on the other side. And Kristoff comes over the sky monitor and he's like, Truman. And he's talking to him. And he is, um, there's something, like he's, he's trying to convince him to stay. He's like, look, like it's not much better out there. Like I have given you, you know, a real life here. It's not better out there. All of the lies are still the same. And, um, Truman asks him, like, was nothing real? And uh, Christoph says, you were real. That's what made you so good to watch. And so Christoph keeps trying to convince him to stay. And he says, and this is great, right? So Christoph is like, say something. You're on live television. And it's a big pause. And um, Truman looks up and is like, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And he takes a bow and he exits through that exit door. And the movie ends with Sylvia putting on a coat, running down her stairs, like presumably to, to go meet Truman, which is so beautiful. And um, everybody's cheering and happy. Some people are upset because the show is over. Uh, transmission was completely cut. Like the show's over. It's done. Yeah. And... Um, it actually ends pretty funny. There are two security guards that have been cut back and forth between a couple of times. And um, 
the very last line of the film is that there's two. The security guards are like, what else is on? Yeah, where's the TV guide? And the movie ends. <laughs> and that is The Truman Show. That's so messed up. Yeah. So my dad and I really like this movie. My dad and I also like to really overanalyze uh, characters together and like talk about symbolism and film and media and all this good stuff. So I texted him when we decided we were going to do a show on the, on the Truman Show. Um, I was like, hey, like what, what discussion points would you like to hear? So I have a couple here um, okay. that I think we should, we should look at. So the first one is the world is how we perceive it, which is an unfortunate, very accurate truth. Christoph yeah. had a point. I'm not saying it was right, but he had a point when he said, all of this is real because you are real and we accept the reality that we're presented. Yeah. And it's just insane to me, though, because it's, it's, it's all this contrived media and no, this is reality. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, look at it from Truman's point of view. If there wasn't those few slip ups. The Truman Show would have went on, mm -hmm. you know. There also would be no movie. It would just... <laughs> we wouldn't be given a cinematic masterpiece to, to gush over. Exactly. But, but Truman's reality literally shattered. He probably had a mental breakdown after the movie. Well, you have to think about it. Uh, Christoph's goal was to have the first televised conception. Yeah. They never... And, and they make a point to say, like, you never see Truman and his wife, like, do anything. Like, they kind of like show some curtains like blowing in the breeze and they play music and you know it's hinted at but it's never shown which is good because like, <laughs> yeah the, the horrifying thought like of of your reality just being completely contrived well yeah i mean and like and like you could see that like a lot of the cast members are guilty like, they feel really bad that they're doing it. Some of them to do. This guy. Marlon was one of them that didn't. It's always. <laughs> Meryl, his wife, also did not. She was more concerned for herself. Which, I mean. She's an actor. To be fair, to be fair, doing something like that has to be emotionally taxing. Well, yeah, you're pretending. Because you're this character forever. You're pretending to love and be married to somebody. And you're sacrificing your own life. Like, it wasn't just Truman being tortured. Truman was the one mainly tortured. He was unknowingly tortured. Yeah. Everyone else was very knowingly tortured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, like, they accepted it. You can't it. tell me that the actresses and the actors were all like, we're sacrificing our lives to do this project. It's, it's crazy to me because, like, Truman never would have, like you said, he never would have known had the slip-ups not happened. Yeah. And that's just so scary to think about. But also, is it if he was none the wiser? It's, I think it is perceptually sad. It, it, it for the voyeur. M morally sad. Well, that was Sylvia's problem. She's like, this isn't right. No. And, and Paul Giamatti was kind of like that towards the end. He's like, we shouldn't kill him. Like, this is somebody's life. Like, no, this is too far. Yeah. Like. There, there's a line here. Yeah, it's... Lying and gaslighting is fine, but murder, <laughs> that's, that's too far. That draw the line of murder. That's an actual crime I could be arrested <laughs> for. The rest of it is just, I've looked at it as a disgusting person. I'm Paul Giamatti. I'm already viewed as a disgusting oh, person. No. <laughs> there was a movie he was in that was really good. I need to remember what it was. <laughs> It was so good. I need to, I'll tell you after we're done. Sure. But but yeah, I thought that that was a pretty interesting discussion point is the world is how we perceive it because that's absolutely true. Like my world is different from your world, but we live in the yeah. same world. Yeah. And but like we can listen to the same speech. Let's just say a politician's doing a speech. You and I is going to perceive that speech even if it's just slightly. Mhm. Mm but it's still in different. Two different ways. It's insane. I mean, it's, it's insane to think about. And so this, the second point is like feeding directly into that is people as actors. 
And um, something one of my theater professors would always say is that we always wear different masks. Um, we always present ourselves as actors in our daily lives. We are different people with different people because that's what reality demands. Like you at, the way he would phrase it is, you at home is not the same you at school. You with your friends is not the same you with your parents. Right. And it's so fascinating because it's like thinking about the actors, you can, I can't defend them, but there is a case for defense with that thought process in mind because they're, they're living a real life, basically just playing the longest game of improv ever. Yeah. And so feelings are real, but there's a separation because you know it's not real. But then it, it begs the question of what is, what is real? I wonder if they like if we were to like make a epilogue for all the uh, the actors. I wonder how many of them had to go to like therapy. <sighs> like if this in, in in our reality happened. Yeah. How many of them would have to go to therapy? I worry about Truman. Oh, Truman had a full on mental break. He's in a he's in a hospital <laughs> somewhere. He He has to. He lived 30 years unknowingly televised. And all of it fake. Yeah. Like, and even when he asked, was any of this real? Yeah. and You were real. Yeah, you were real. And Kristoff... And that was the response. Yeah, and, and the fact that Kristoff as well was like, the same lies are out in the real, quote unquote, real world. Because at the end of the day, people are just actors. Yeah, but I, what my counter argument would be, would be, that may be so, but those lies are real. Yeah. Even the lies not here written. are fake. Even the lies here are fake. And I mean, we could look at the gaslighting as if we're if we're going to follow Kristoff's line of thinking. The gaslighting to keep him there. You know, you and I have many of those fears about like our goals. We yeah, we have those those conversations of transparency. Um and the fear of I don't think you're going to gaslight me. And I, I am confident in saying you don't think I'm going to gaslight you. But no. I have a fear of gaslighting myself. Yeah. Yeah. So it is weird when you're in that creative headspace, right? Where you're like the imposter syndrome really sneaks in or you tell yourself like I'm never going to be good enough. You know, it's like it's like it's an interesting rabbit hole to to fall down and tumble down. But yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the the other point that my dad had brought up was media shaping what we think and feel. And I think that that's a really interesting one because I we have a whole podcast based around media. Yeah. And our feelings towards said characters in that media. And it's really interesting to me. We're going to get real meta now. Mhm. Mm because it is all constructed. Like, let me get my tinfoil yeah. hat real fast. Hold on. <laughs> but, but like, it's all written out. It, it's. It is. And, and that's reality. I think everyone both accepts and rolls along with, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, of the media outlets, they have a purpose for the story. It's not just a story. There's a purpose behind it. And I'm not going to say it's propaganda because I don't think it's propaganda. I think propaganda is a lot deeper. It is manipulation, though. It is manipulation. It is 100% manipulating because they'll word things different. Um, I remember during the 2020 presidential campaign. <laughs> Woo! Hot topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember the 2020 presidential campaign, the differences between the, I'm not going to name them just in case. <laughs> I, I am terrified because I've seen how many like random YouTubers and stuff will get like flagged. Yeah. But I'll say it like this. The conservative news media mm -hmm. had the events of January 6th, which was a tragedy. Yes. 
I don't care who you are. It's a tragedy. Um, yeah, it was a. I'm I'm going I'm going to get that. That's about as political as I'll get because I I think that should be universally accepted that the events that happened that day should not have occurred, and due to the words of a certain person being encouraged by other people, it was incited. But the headlines on the conservative news media was very different than the ones on the more the closer to unbiased slash left-leaning media Mm -hmm. because they had a name at stake because those are our people. Those are our people. Those are our politicians. Let the listener listener be known that Joe was using air quotes (laughs) around the R statements. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I am definitely not conservative by any means. (laughs) What? Um, You? No. For real? That's a different topic for a different no podcast. I had no idea. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> but people who watch the conservative media outlets have a very different outlook on the events that happened on January 6th. Mm-hmm. And those who listen to or read the tweets of people that are more conservative mm-hmm. have a very different outlook on the events of oh no this is just something this was a protest that got too rowdy yeah and however the things that happened in ferguson was a riot yeah you can't yeah it... and so the perception like you said the perception of media is very heavily influenced oh absolutely is very heavily influenced by what is our purpose here and it shouldn't be that way and like you could say that with a lot of things mm-hmm That if it's a news outlet, then you need to cover the news, not opinions. You're here for the facts. You're not here to... And, and, you know, you can have shows on your 24-7. But see, I think the death of news was 24-7 news stations. Because what are you going to do to fill in the time that you don't have news? Yeah, you have to keep people entertained. Yeah. So let's bring in some crazies on both sides (laughs) and let's discuss it. And now all of a sudden, oh, those are getting ratings. Amp it up. Well, then we need to up that. And so we're going to hire more crazies or more extremists or more loud mouths who know nothing. And this is on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. Know nothing of what they're discussing. And now those people are the ones being watched because those are the personalities. And we love a personality. We don't like inf- information. Right. I'm not saying we dislike information, but we don't like a a... Ben Stein narrating something to us from a science book. Yeah, I mean, given the choice between reading a fiction novel um, or reading a newspaper, you're going to choose. You're going to choose the, the the fiction novel. Yeah, like you want to be entertained, you want to be gripped and grasped, and you know all that good stuff. And I think to that point, that's kind of the thing with the Truman Show as well. Is Christoph was willing to kill Truman to keep ratings, to keep yeah, to keep well, what bigger rating? Than a live death. To kill off your biggest star. Yeah. I'm going to use Game of Thrones for an example. <gasps> oh, no. <laughs> One of the biggest... The the biggest social media moment involving a fictional television show was the Red Wedding. Yeah, that was crazy. Oh, my gosh. One of my favorite, like, cinematic scenes. It's so wonderfully shot. Yeah. The music, everything. It is so chaotically shot. There's no shaky cam, but it's just constant transitions of just everyone getting slaughtered. I watched it out of context. I stopped watching after season one. It just, it was not for me. That's understandable. It was not for me. I found that out very quickly. And I said, oh, oh Yeah, no. <laughs> probably first episode. It was like, uh. I said, oh boy, I can't watch this. I finished the first season. Yeah. Um, and then I, I saw the social media blowing up about, oh my gosh, did you guys watch? And I was like, no, but I need to be socially relevant, I guess. So I like looked it up. <laughs> like, like I, I watched it and I was like, oh, wow. It's so intense. It's. And it's, it broke Twitter. It literally broke Twitter because everyone was talking about it at the same time. Yeah. I, yeah, I, Wow. And, and and so we if we want to talk about like how influential ratings are and like how influential death is to ratings. And it also goes with the conception as well. He was fully willing to exploit arguably one of the most precious things a person can accomplish in life. Yeah. For views. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. It's it's also 
this is actually a conversation that like I'm not, I'm I'm surprised that is like coming to me naturally. But YouTube. <gasps> and I know this is going on YouTube and stuff like this, but the fact that that YouTube and a lot of people nowadays the, the quote-unquote prank YouTubers, mm-hmm. also known as the harassing YouTubers, the ones that want to show off all their wealth, even though most likely they're just renting the thing for... Or in massive a credit card debt. Short, or massive credit card debt, that they're willing to sacrifice so much of their dignity and their self-respect for a moment of clout. And can you imagine being forced to it's do that? It's a world of Kristoff's. Yeah, I mean, like, can you imagine being forced to do that unknowingly? Ugh. Your entire life is on display, and everything effectively is a lie. Yeah, you're. I'm imagining like my my teenage years, mm-hmm. which are like the most mentally fragile. Like you're like developing so much in such a short amount of time, and to imagine that all those birthdays. All that motherly love and and all that was a lie. Kristoff talks to Truman about in the in those last moments. He says, "You know, I was there to see your first steps. I remember the episode where you lost your first tooth and like reacting so fondly, like giggling to himself, like as a proud if he dad. Was a dad. Yeah, like a proud father. And and as the viewer, you you want to punch Kristoff in the face. Yeah, because it's like I don't know. It's just." It's crazy to me. I I think this this movie, like like the especially the character of Kristoff, could align a lot with executives mm-hmm. of wanting to exploit tragedies mm-hmm. for clout. And it could also, I mean, if you want to like really inflate their egos, people with drama YouTube channels and people with, and I'm okay with calling them out. I've called them out on my live streams and I've called them out in other videos. Like, it's so depressing that we, and I'm not saying all of them, like, I will call this one out because I'm doing it in a more positive sense. Philip DeFranco, he presents news as news. He'll give his opinion on it, but he gives you the facts and then he gives his opinion on the facts. And he does it because he wants people informed. But, like, other ones just want that clout. They want that conflict. They want the, the, the controversy. You know, there's the one Eminem song. You know, that's all about, you know, it, I, it, it's not the same without me because I'm the one that brings the controversy. And I think a lot of these YouTubers think that they're like the same thing that like, oh, I, I bring the controversy. And no, you just look like an idiot. You're. Yeah. And, and I think that's what hurts so much is like, I remember when YouTube was games. Yeah, me too. And, you know, my dad remembers when the news was news and and all that stuff and it's like as a people now like we look at everything like a number yeah and and we and we wonder why like people that are in like retail are so unhappy and like it's because no one looks at people like people no people are commodities yeah people are commodities they're they're items you can exchange them at well resources which is crazy and and i think that that's that is what breaks my heart so much about the truman show right is truman is living his life because it's all he knows and you know it's not real yeah and it breaks your heart because you see him be so happy and you genuine genuine happiness and you know that the other person giving that to him is fake there's these moments um because his wife is a contractually obligated actor. She has to yeah. do uh, like product endorsements and she'll do it in the middle of a conversation. Like Truman is having a breakdown and he's sitting at the table <laughs> and, um, and uh, she says, oh honey, like you just need to relax with new Mococo, like, you know, Mococo uh, hot chocolate or whatever. And she talks through it and she, she just keeps going on this like whole thing. And she's got this big plastic smile and Truman looks at her and it says, what the hell are you talking about? Like, who are you talking to? <laughs> He's like, there, there's no one here. Who are you talking to? And she keeps going with the endorsement because she has to, she has to do it. That's how it's paid for. There's no commercials in the show. It's all sponsorship and it's all like product placement. 
And yeah. there, there's moments in the show as well where this billboard behind Truman changes like all the time and he gets stopped by the same two people every day and they push him against it so that the camera focuses on that product. Mm -hmm. And it's so sick. It's so sick when you get down into it. And the fact that this film takes place over four days, yeah. 30 years was shattered in four days and nobody listened to him. No, because they couldn't because there was money at stake. Right. Which is a whole other situation. And that could go, yeah. that could go talk about <laughs> mental health. That could go into physical disabilities. I think the Truman Show does represent, it's not a mental health film. But no, but you could make it into the it. parallels are there. You could translate it. The parallels are yeah. there, and and I talked about you know my struggles with anxiety and depression, and nothing felt real. No, it's all fabricated. It all feels, fa especially how you present yourself. It's all fabricated, and yeah, there were many days where I felt like an actor in the Truman Show, right? Where I'm like going through the motions, and I'm like, okay, like time to put on a good happy face, and we're gonna we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do that, and everything is great and fine and wonderful. And on the inside, I know it's not true. And it's the same thing with Truman, yeah. too, where he's like, something feels really wrong, but I don't know what it is. And when you're surrounding yourself with people who don't, and I'm, I'm lucky to have not had this experience, but when you're surrounding yourself with people who don't believe you and say, oh, everything's fine. What are you upset about? You have nothing to be sad yeah. about. That breaks you. It does. There was a lot of people, I think, thought they were helping me mm -hmm. when I was going through my anxiety, which I didn't even know was anxiety until I was into my 20s. It's tricky. It sneaks up on it you. It is. <laughs> uh, I was told that it was the Holy Spirit convicting me because I did something wrong. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Which is great to tell <laughs> someone with anxiety. Well, especially like... That the Holy Spirit, you know... Yeah, that makes you feel part worse. Part of the Holy Trinity. The Most High God is convicting you for doing something wrong. Uh, yeah, conviction feels really great. different than anxiety. Uh, hate, to, yeah. hate to pop that bubble there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on my <laughs> little hat, right? Like, I grew up in church, and I am very much a Christian, and I believe, you know, in God and the Trinity, and... Yeah, it, it is. It's a very different feeling. Um, well, even even then, like to just immediately write off. Of, yeah, that's not cool. <laughs> oh, this kid that's going through, you know, that is still recovering from like the worst time in his life. <laughs> yes. Up to that point that God is convicting him. I think I would hold off on that. That's wild. Yeah, that's that's a wild thing to say and to I was, a child. But I was dealing with a lot of anger problems. I was dealing with a lot of aggression issues. And it's like, oh, well, it's because of your anger. And you were a child. I was 15. Yeah. That's at most entirely unacceptable and never okay. No, it was awful. It was awful. And so to imagine, you know, that was just a year, maybe two. Imagine that for 30. Yeah. Of being gaslit lied to everything from the moment you existed outside of your mother to the moment you walked out that door he was filmed in the womb as well well there you his go. entire life was televised broadcasted yeah so when you were conceived when you were a zygote yeah you were on display and everything leading up to that was a lie other than your alive right if you haven't seen the truman show i highly highly recommend it 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 is so good i i don't have the words to describe how incredible the film is it's an important film it's important jim carrey as well just amazing actor anyway um amazing dramatic actor holy smokes um, yeah. But... There was another movie he was in. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that'll be another one, I'm sure. I, I will sob. Oh, yeah. I will sob. But it's so... It makes you take a look at yourself and say, what am I supporting? Because all of these people, you know, some of them could agree, like, oh, this isn't right that they're televising this man's life, but they still watched yeah, they still supported it. They still it by their supported silence. it. It's kind of like, again, I could go into social media about that too. Yeah. About, you know, 
the the guy in Japan recently. Yeah, we all agreed that was a terrible thing to do. All of the stuff he did was terrible. But you still watched his live streams. Yeah. You still fed into that dopamine rush he's getting. You rage watched. You yeah. you hate shared, you know? Yeah. And like, look at this effing idiot. Yeah, and yet that doesn't matter. They're still getting views and money. So it's... Yeah. And that's the same thing with the Truman Show. And it, it has... That movie has always made me more careful of what I support. Because it's like, what are you... He chose me. <laughs> Oops. No, I'm just no. kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it has made me more careful of, of that. Because somebody's life can be ruined. Yeah. And I think... I'm not going to mention the YouTuber, but you know who I'm talking about. Like, there was a huge controversy with him and his vlogs. Um, yeah. Yeah. So... That was another one, but anyways. There's a lot of YouTubers like that. Yeah, there are. But anyways, um, please go watch the film if you haven't. Um, and leave a comment or send us a little DM or something telling us your thoughts because this is a cool movie to talk about. And there, this is the, merely the surface of it. Um, but we've, we've been talking for an hour um at yeah. this point we might do a follow-up who knows <laughs> like we may like come back to to mr truman the truman show part two mr burbank um yeah. gosh i i love that character so much and i love the film it's ugh, there's nothing like it but thank you guys for listening and um if you like the sound of our voices you can head over to chibilution audios on youtube there is a link in the description and um, if you like the sound of Joe's voice, he has a Twitch and he live streams. Yeah, twitch.tv chibi Joe VT. The, the small power that I hold there, I'm a mod. I will pin your comment. Beware. She's a mod there. <laughs> I'm a mod there. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be on a t-shirt or something, right? I'm a mod She's there. She's a mod there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, guys. Team Sam. She's a mod Team there. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah. That's it. So, in case we don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>